Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a statement by Keith Brown on winter resilience. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so that there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Uh, Minister, 10 minutes. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I am grateful to Parliament for the opportunity to make a statement on our winter resilience in Scotland. Uh, whilst we know that severe weather will cause disruption, uh, this Government has taken a wide range of steps to improve our resilience to the challenges of winter, uh, to mitigate its impacts and also to recover our transport networks, uh, businesses and allow daily life to get back to normal as quickly as possible. Uh, today's multi-agency preparations for the amber weather warnings issued this morning I think are a good example of that. Our resilience work is undertaken in partnership with a broad range of public, private and third sector partners. And that's included new investment, development and innovation, uh, all of which have learned lessons from previous winters. We have made sure that the lessons of previous winters were identified, considered and acted upon through the work of the Winter Weather Review Group in 2011 uh, and our ongoing lessons learned process. We have also tested and reflected on those lessons collectively with a wide range of partners through Exercise Polar Storm in 2011 and Exercise Arctic Blast and Exercise Green Delta in 2012, plus a range of other exercises taking place locally and regionally. They uh, have been launched and are running uh, Scotland's fourth National Resilience Week and a longer running preparedness campaign, Ready for Winter, uh, winter in partnership with the British Red Cross and a wide range of other partners calling on everyone to make their own preparations for winter. Uh, Transport Scotland's winter service media launch was held earlier this week to promote and publicise the fact that this winter our roads will be serviced more quickly than ever when snow and ice hit. Uh, we are constantly working with our partners to improve the technology available and to predict events and also to provide early warning both to responders and to the public. We have supported the Met Office in developing major improvements to their National Severe Weather Warning Service and invested over £8 million in the Floodline Warnings Direct Scheme, improving information to the public as to when they may be at risk from flooding. On the 14th of August 2014, my colleague Paul Wheelhouse, Minister for Environment and Climate Change, announced Scotland's first National Centre for Resilience, the NCR, which will build on experience developed in the southwest of Scotland to develop national capabilities focusing on natural hazards, community resilience, flooding resilience, as well as providing research purpose and facilities through the creation of the new Centre for Research on Resilience. We have also invested sensibly in our transport resilience. For example, as of the 4th of November, there were approximately 693,000 tonnes of salt in stock, eh, on, eh, either in stock or on order, and that includes the strategic salt reserve which the government has. And that represents more than double the amount of salt that was used last winter. We also have in place a range of new resources to improve intelligence, to monitor patrol and, where necessary, to act. Eh, the winter fleet for trunk roads will have in excess of 195 vehicles available for spreading salt and ploughing, which is the highest level ever available on our trunk roads. All of that fleet will be available to provide support to the front line and patrol vehicles, as well as to cover breakdowns and essential maintenance. During the 2013-14 winter season, 75 new state-of-the-art gritters replaced older vehicles and 34 of these new machines were bigger than the vehicle they replaced, uh, with the capacity to spread more salt. Uh, the new fourth generation contracts winter service in the east commenced on the 1st of October this year, and that will follow similar principles. And by the end of 2014-15 winter season, new state-of-the-art gritters will be operational across the entire country. Uh, new weather stations, temperature sensors, cameras, messaging signs, new icebreakers, uh, a stockpile of alternative de-icers and welfare kits to help anybody affected by disruption have all been introduced since 2010. And the 2014 Commonwealth Games legacy has also equipped Transport Scotland with a larger pool of staff trained in resilience operations, while key parts of the network have been strengthened with increased camera infrastructure and will build on that legacy to continually improve our response to severe events. 
Uh, significant investment has also taken place on our railways and in our airports. Uh, ScotRail and Network Rail have invested over £4 million to improve winter resilience. The airports have procured new equipment at their expense uh, and developed specialist snow teams. We have also introduced new procedures to ensure resources are well used and the response to challenges is as effective as possible, and that is based on the successful operation of the Multi-Agency Response Team, or MART. The new purpose-built Traffic Scotland Control Centre at South Queensferry will improve coordination and joint working. All motorways continue to be covered by winter patrols, which give a 30-minute response to incidents. Uh, control rooms can monitor the temperature on key routes remotely through sensors and see the conditions live via a network of cameras. And road users themselves can keep up to date through a range of media, including internet, internet radio, uh, smartphone updates on the move, in addition to more traditional methods. We have also though, worked with power and telecommunications companies to help them build their own response capability further through improved customer service arrangements, the enhancement of key infrastructure and backup systems, and also increased customer information on being prepared. It is not just, of course, cold weather, but uh, extremely high winds can also lead to disruption. Uh, but providers here are also taking additional steps based on the lessons of previous years, and the government has invested in backup systems to ensure responders can continue to operate effectively. We are also supporting people to keep warm in their homes in spite of increases to energy bills. Unlike the UK Government, which has scrapped fuel poverty funding, we are committing almost a quarter of a billion pounds to it in a three-year period. And we remain determined to help householders stay warm and reduce their energy bills and are working with councils and energy companies to tackle fuel poverty. We have also developed a protocol to help ensure that vulnerable people can be identified and prioritised should there be issues with supplies of electricity, gas or heating oil. We are also continuing with a programme of work to build personal and community resilience, investing in the future through the development of a resilience education resource uh, ready for emergencies. And that's already been used by schools across Scotland to help young people assess risks and prepare themselves and their communities more effectively. We also continue to support local communities that are taking steps to build their own uh, community resilience through the uptake of our Community Emergency Planning Toolkit and through the provision of a range of financial and practical support to communities and also to local authorities. We have improved the operation of the Government's own emergency arrangements by reviewing the experience both of recent winters and also other major events. For example, we had the, the uh, volcanic ash cloud, which also caused substantial disruption. Uh, and we have required those arrangements to be used. Uh, there is continual development of the staffing and training arrangements for SCORE uh, and a new approach for sharing information between resilience partnerships and SCORE when it is active. I think, Presiding Officer, it is true to say that we try to learn something new each time Scotland is beset by severe weather. We also try to make sure that we do not just look at previous incidents and plan on that basis. We try to plan for the unexpected. It has become a cliche now, but I think we always try to prepare for the worst whilst hoping for the best, not least in relation to the weather. But it is my view that the government and the responder community are doing all that they can to build Scotland's resilience to severe weather for winter eh, and all year round. And at a time of severe economic challenges and environmental change, we need to show that Scotland's infrastructure eh, and the services are ready to support our business and our people, to be the resilient Scotland that we all want to see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes of questions, after which we will move on to next business. So members who wish to ask a question of the Minister should press the request to speak button now. And I call Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. And I thank the Minister for advance copy of his statement. The, the Minister has spoken at length about national planning events, the National Resilience Centre and additional facilities and plant which will be used to keep the Trunt Road network clear. But unless councils have that um, access to salt, machinery and people power to keep the local roads open, then those expertly um, and efficiently cleared trunk roads that the Minister mentioned will be li of little comfort to our constituents since they won't be able to, to access that network. Given local authority budgets have been cut in real terms for a number of years, how confident is the Minister in the resilience of the whole transport network and not just the trunk road network? The Minister 
made a, a brief mention a, quote, of a range of financial and practical support to communities and local authorities. Can the Minister outline exactly what level of financial support will be provided to local authorities to deal with adverse weather and, and also if there will be any contingency funds made available to local authorities who have to deal with specific extreme local weather conditions that, um, that other local authorities don't have to. Finally, I might be wrong, but I don't think I heard the Minister mention remote or rural communities or constituencies or constituents in his, in his statement. I would just ask that what has the Scottish Government done to facilitate discussions with local businesses, um, farmers, road contractors and other businesses who operate with heavy plant which could be adapted in rural areas to create a much wider uh, localised resilience network. Thank you. Minister. Hey, uh, thank you, President Officer. To take the, I think, the substantive point underlying uh, Mark Griffin's questions first, which is about resources for local authorities. Uh, I'm very pleased that, uh, given the size of the cake which we have in Scotland, that councils get a bigger share of that cake than they have done in the past. Certainly when I was a council leader, when that cake reduced, or that share of the cake reduced every year. I just remind Mark Griffin that the last act of the Cabinet Secretary, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury of the last Labour government, had the advice to his successor, which is there is no money left. That was what the Labour government told the incoming Conservative and Lib Dem government. Now, I make that point because, of course, I do acknowledge there are pressure on local government budgets. But within the uh, resources which we have, we've increased that share which goes to local authorities. It's also true to say, as Mark Griffin rightly says, that councils are responsible for the vast bulk of our road network. 94% of Scotland's roads are, are local roads. It's also true to say that in law, they are the roads authority. So we can't just go in and start doing things, obviously, on their road network. But what does happen, and I hope this will assure, uh, reassure uh, Mark Griffin, is that we work jointly on these issues. For example, uh, both in the North East, in Aberdeen uh, and in the south, we have contracts whereby sometimes the trunk road operating comp companies will uh, salt or grit the roads for local authorities and vice versa. Uh, and that, to me, makes eminent sense. And also, in addition to that, when we have issues of disruption, certainly I have asked and Transport Scotland officials have asked that our resources, if they're not being maximised or used to the maximum at that point, should be directed towards offers towards local authorities. That offer is often made and not accepted for perfectly legitimate reasons, but we make that, uh, uh, that, that offer. Uh, Mark Griffin also mentioned uh, rural and remote communities, and I did mention a number of things in my statement which relate to that. You may remember the point I was making about um, making sure that we can get assistance here quickly, especially when there's, for example, a lack of power, uh, possibly water, uh, and other vital uh, things or communications for those areas. And going back to that experience in 2010-11, the biggest challenge that we faced was really about that last mile of deliveries, especially people that were... Uh, relying on unconventional energy means, where they required deliveries to their house that people couldn't access. So there was a great deal of joint working to try and make sure we did that with all sorts of organisations. In relation to the agricultural communities, which Mark Griffin mentions, we did examine that quite exhaustively. And there are issues to do with that which don't apply in uh, some other countries, not least to do with the legal requirements and also uh, damage to roads as well. We have been more than willing, though, to work with those communities where they feel there's something they can offer to us and we've certainly done that. We've worked in a collegiate way, and I think that's why we've seen an improved response right throughout the country, including those remote and rural areas. Alex Johnson. I thank the Minister for his statement, and I'm glad that so much effort has been put in. However, I hope that the tendency to pat ourselves on the back before a single snowflake falls doesn't result in me being back here in a few weeks' time uh, lamenting the passing of a minister who simply had to resign because he believed what he was told. Uh, on the issue of salt stocks, the... On the issue of salt stocks, uh, in 2010-11, uh, we ran out of salt. It was one of the worst winters we'd had in a long, long time. And the problem was that stocks were held at a level that were consistent with requirements in a series of mild winters. We've now had three mild winters, and I'm concerned that ambition as far as salt stocks is concerned may be reducing. The minister said that uh, salt stocks are at a level twice what were used last year. How would that compare with what was actually used in 2010-2011? 
Uh, similarly, uh, I'm concerned also that road maintenance should be a priority. Uh, will the Minister be in a position to ensure that resources are available so that when road conditions begin to deteriorate and potholes require to be uh, mended, that local authorities have that resource at their disposal? Uh, there are many other subjects I could cover, but one I wish to prioritise is the area of coastal flooding. Uh, I notice that there is a storm warning for the North East uh, tonight. I notice also that there is a full moon and there will be a high tide, and the conditions would be perfect for another flooding event in Stonehaven. Uh, is the Minister in a position to guarantee that emergency services will be on standby to ensure that communities at high risk of flooding can have the support necessary at short notice? Minister. Uh, can I uh, uh, thank the member for his questions? Uh, first of all, on the issue of salt, I will give him actually a breakdown if he, he likes the relative levels that we've had, not just in that you know, terrible year of 2010-11 in terms of the bad weather, but also the subsequent years. And I don't know whether he's suggesting that we should have more than twice the amount of salt that we used last year or not, but to me it seems like a pretty good basis for making sure that we can deal with issues. It's also true to say that because of that winter in 2010-11, everybody was looking for salt at that point. And sometimes you get, for example, the highways agency, which comes in, hoovers up all the available salt, and that created problems for uh, other people. So what we've done is tried to make sure that we have as much salt as necessary in stock. Not just salt, we've also developed other materials which we can use for temperatures below which salt is ineffective as well. So I'm confident we've done... Uh, not just through getting enough salt, but making sure we have that strategic reserve so that if a local authority, for whatever reason, starts to run out, they can call on that strategic reserve. Uh, and again, that emphasises the joint uh, working that we're talking about. Uh, on the uh, other points, I, I don't think there is a sense of us patting ourselves on the back. I've tried to outline what we have done. And of course, you want to try and reassure people that those arrangements have been put in place uh, to make sure that we can deal with this effectively. Uh, you know, just to make the obvious point, and I did make this and saw it appear in a very different way uh, in the media subsequently, we are always at the risk of having disruption through weather. Scotland is uh, um, not the same, as it was often said, as Canada or Norway, which everyone says. They deal with snow very well. Well, they do, but they have snow, you know, right throughout their winter period. They have a different way of dealing with it. We do have the situation with a more temperate climate in Scotland that we can have a, a very sudden shift between snow, freezing rain um, and dry periods as well. And that can happen very quickly. So we have to try and have a response which deals with the particular circumstances uh, in relation to uh, our own weather systems. Uh, the other point I think uh, Alec Johnson made was the, the local authorities and road maintenance. Now, it is the case in the past, especially that 2010-11 period where we had that very prolonged, very cold uh, period which happened. There was damage done to uh, roads, both local and trunk roads, uh, out of proportion to what we'd normally expect. And I'm pretty sure from memory that we did provide additional resources to local government subsequently. We provided more to Transport Scotland as well for the trunk road network and did the same uh, in terms of local authorities as well. And we always have to keep our eye on that. Uh, it is the responsibility of local authorities to look after their roads hours to look after hours. But if there is something which is exceptional in the same way, he also mentioned flooding that we do that, then of course we'd have to look at that. And just on the point of flooding, yes, I think the assurance I would give is that the responders are ready, um, as they are each time we get the warnings from the Met, whether it's an amber, sometimes even a, a red warning. Uh, the Met office has upgraded the yellow warning for heavy rain to amber, which is be prepared. And it mentions within that South Aberdeenshire in particular. Uh, that warning came into effect at 1 o'clock today. will go through until 7 o'clock uh, uh, earlier. Now, it may have been updated since then, but the earlier um, warnings suggested there was not a risk of coastal flooding. But I bear in mind the points that Alec Johnson has made and undertake to check that and come back to him whether that's been upgraded to see if there is some additional risk. But in any event, the responders are ready to respond to the circumstances as they arise. Christine Graham, followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In that same severe winter of 2010-11, the A68 at Sutra in my constituency was closed for some four days. This is a major trunk road essential to many communities for deliveries, businesses, and also, indeed, for con connectivity between the Border General Hospital and Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Four days, to me, was far too long. What specific measures have or will be taken to avoid this happening again? Minister. 
Mm -hmm. hey, can I say to the member, and I remember very well the problems that there were both at Hart Hill and also in the A68 at Sutra. Um, and both of these locations have been identified as vulnerable locations, and they're also defined as areas requiring special attention. Uh, these have specific mitigation measures established within the operating company's winter service plans. And examples of that uh, kind of specific measure would be additional and specialist plant, which is pre-deployed when colder forecasts dictate, uh, patrols that would operate out with specified times, and also additional resources. Uh, and specifically on the issue of salt stocks in those locations, the pre-deployed vehicles will be fully loaded and supplemented by patrol vehicles, which are also fully loaded. Uh, our South East Operating Company have salt barns at Burrowmuir, Bilston Glen, Tannockside, Hoyke and Newton St Boswells, as well as Gore Bridge. Uh, and that uh, stock exceeds 20,000 tonnes collectively. I also mentioned earlier in my response to Alec Johnson that we have new materials, which can also help in relation to the example which the member cites in relation to a four-day period of very cold weather, well below the normally expected um, cold snap and lasting for a longer period. So we have materials which operate below seven degrees below, which is the effective temperature that salt uh, operates down to. And also we have now um, additional equipment, an icebreaker, um, for example, which going back to the issue of the M8, the big problem there was to try and break that ice and get people moving again. So we have learned those lessons. I'm sure if there are further incidents, we will learn lessons from that as well, but we've taken real measures to help in the situation, both of the A68 at Sutra and on the M8 at Hart Hill. Claudia Beamish, followed by Rob Gibson. Uh, although there has been robust funding for... Sorry, apologies. There's been robust funding for the Floodline Warnings Direct Scheme. Um, the Minister will be aware that the budget for 2015-16, um, the funding for natural assets and flooding, uh, has remained the same in cash terms. And uh, the, this means that there is a 0.5% um, reduction in real terms. Does the Minister believe it would have been prudent or could still be the case that there should be an increase in the flooding budget in view of the extreme weather conditions that we've experienced and could he also provide details if not now um, through um, his colleague uh, the Minister for Environment of SEPA's 14 flooding strategies because I was reassured by SEPA in April that these would be forthcoming this autumn. Minister. Hey, first of all, I'm perfectly happy to ask my colleague Paul Wheelhouse to provide the information which the member is looking for. Um, just to say in relation to the budget line that she refers to, again, which is in uh, Paul Wheelhouse's area, that's not the only budget line that we use for flooding. There are a number of other budget lines, including those which deal with emergency situations uh, and within contingencies in terms of the Berlin formula as well. So there are a number of areas which apply to flooding and also there's been quite a substantial degree of works in different parts of the country, not least in the south of Scotland on both sides, uh, to address the consequences of previous flooding, including coastal flooding. And it isn't possible, just to state the obvious, to increase every budget line every year. So you do have to make uh, choices in relation to this. But uh, obviously, Paul Wheelhouse is aware of this and has allocated what he thinks are sufficient funds. But as I said at the start, I'm more than happy to come back to the member with uh, the information from Paul Wheelhouse that she's looking for. Rob Gibson, followed by Jim Hume. Thank you, President Officer. During periods of rapid snowmelt and uh, heavy rain events, what actions does the Minister see are needed during forestry extraction operations to protect roads from slurry and logs landing on the carriageway? and the need to keep culverts clear so as to allow safe surface water drainage, all of which have occurred recently on routes in my constituency and elsewhere. Minister. Hey, it's, it's a very good point. And I visited um, the A82 uh, just, past, um, uh, just before sorry, Fort William and saw the effect of what had happened there. I mean, with very heavy rainfall and having had some uh, logs cut very far up the hill, um, it, was able, it was possible for those logs to travel a very long distance and, as a member rightly says, end up at the roadside. I think it's very important for very obvious reasons that should not be allowed to happen. And we have to make sure, and we have spoken with the Forestry Commission to make sure that future um, tree cutting, sometimes which is undertaken in order to protect the safety of uh, road users, and that was true also at that location to some extent, but when that happens, that any logs which are left there, I'm not talking about uh, logs prepared for timber, but logs which are cut down for that purpose, are kept well away and safe from the road network for very obvious reasons, and that applies not just to the trunk road network, but also to uh, the local road network. And as the member mentions as well, it's Often the case that slurry can also be responsible for that and also the blocking of drains that happened recently 
on the A83. What we have to do in that situation is sometimes you cannot prevent these things from happening, or you can't prevent them right across the country, but you have to make sure you have a very quick response to make sure that's cleared as soon as possible, because if the drain isn't cleared, then you start to get things coming out either side onto the road network, and that's something we want to prevent. Jim Hume, followed by Roderick Campbell. Uh, thank you. Uh, thousands of airline passengers faced delays and cancellations after Edinburgh Airport was forced to close due to heavy snow in January 2011. Last December, Prestwick was used more due to other UK airports struggling with snow. Can the Minister advise what measures are in place to ensure that our airports remain open throughout the winter weather? Minister? Uh, can I say that, with the exception of Prestwick, this is obviously a matter for the individual airport operators. And what they did after the 2010-11 uh, winter was to go to Scandinavia in particular and look at the measures which were undertaken there. They're not all applicable here. For example, some Scandinavian airports do not take the uh, snow off the runway. It's packed down and it's used. I've landed on those uh, runways myself in the past. The snow is left there, just in the same way it's often left on roads as well, and people use snow chains. Uh, but the lessons which are appropriate to Scotland were learned. There was substantial investment by Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Glasgow in relation to what they found. And they have spent, I think, over £3 million on new measures. It's also true to say during that winter uh, we did make an offer. I made it myself to Edinburgh Airport on a particular day when we had the trunk road next to the airport cleared, but there were still issues at the airport itself. However, it's also the case that the equipment that we use on trunk roads is not suitable for uh, airport runways. Um, so it's not possible for us to share equipment in that way. We do share best practice. There has been substantial investment made by the airports, and like the government, they can sometimes be criticised for investing in equipment which is not used, at least for two or three years. But they have taken the necessary precautions, and I'm very pleased that they have. Roderick Campbell, followed by David Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Minister, what practical steps can farmers take to prepare their farms for winter? And in turn, what support can farmers offer the local community in the event of severe weather? Minister? I hesitate to suggest any expertise I, might, I may have for um, agricultural concerns in terms of the preparations that they can take, but certainly we do consult regularly with uh, the, the affected communities, businesses and others about the approaches we can take to winter. Uh, the issue of what they can offer in terms of sometimes helping with uh, moving cars, sometimes helping moving snow to allow access on more local roads is one which we've discussed. We did find there were some issues which prevented us from doing that on as big a scale as perhaps we would want to, and also, to be fair, the farming community wanted to do as well. But we have worked on the basis of trying to talk to the interest groups, and the NFU in particular. They have a number of other issues about using trunk roads as well that they'd like to see advanced. But we do consult with the farming community, um, and if the member is aware of any issues remaining of concern, they'd like to see further consultation or joint working on them. I'm more than happy to meet with representatives, as I have done recently, and discuss those. David Stewart, followed by Graham Day. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister identify what, if any, rural and island emergency funding is available to hard-pressed local authorities for winter resilience work? Highland Council convener Jimmy Gray told me this morning that with 4,500 miles of local roads, 1,300 bridges and 32,000 children to get to school every morning, his authority struggles every winter to finance the staff machinery and the 6,000 tonnes of salt necessary to prepare for the challenging extremes of Highland winters. Minister. Yeah, I think we deal with that in exactly the same way that previous administrations have. It's factored into, obviously, the grant-aided expenditure which local authorities uh, receive. And in relation to each area, whether it's an island authority or the Highlands in this case, sometimes it's different in different uh, contexts for urban authorities, we try to factor that in. Um, and we have discussions with COSLA on a regular basis to make sure we reflect that. I do acknowledge what the member says about the particular uh, pressures in the Highlands, um, especially in relation to having enough salt to cover a pretty vast area uh, and also to ensure that people can travel safely to and from school during that period. But these things have been factored in and beyond that, if, as I said earlier on, an extreme weather event is exceptional and presents exceptional demands, then of course the Government will always look to help local authorities in that situation. Thank you, Minister. We have uh, three members who are yet to ask a question of the Minister. Um, we have a generous allocation of time for the next debate, so I intend to make sure that time is allocated here to allow these questions to be heard. Graham Day, followed by Mary Fee. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, three winters ago, efforts to clear many streets in Angus were hampered by householders responding to predicted heavy overnight snowfall uh, by parking out in the roads rather than their driveways. They did so believing that would make it easier to get about their business in the morning, when in reality, all it did was create obstructions for the gritters, and very often cars ended up walled in by ploughed snow. Would the Minister agree that there are simple, common-sense things the public can do to ensure we keep Scotland moving during severe winter weather? Minister? Hey, I know our colleague uh, Sandra White has been trying to progress a, a responsible parking bill uh, in this Parliament, and I think um, some of the same lessons apply. It is really for local authorities to make sure they take up this community message, although we are happy to work with them on doing that. But uh, Graham Day is quite right. If you move your car out onto the a local road in particular, which does not then have the space for a gritter or a, a snowplow to come down, then you're preventing them from being able to undertake that work. So I would just ask that uh, individuals think about the consequences of where they place the cars. They want to have their, their road gritted and made safe, obviously, and we have to allow the plant to, through local authorities to get to that. And as I say, if local authorities want, want to consider whether there's a broader message across the country, then we're more than happy to look at how we can do that jointly. Mary Fee, followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Minister for an advanced copy of the statement. And, Presiding Officer, I make no apology for repeating the point made by my colleague Mark Griffin that local authorities are bearing the brunt of Scottish Government cuts against a backdrop of rising costs. My own local authority, Renfrewshire, remains one of the most underfunded local authorities across Scotland. And in recent years, I have received numerous complaints from constituents that pathways are rarely cleared when winter weather is at its worst. And whilst I welcome the news of 75 state-of-the-art gritters, can the Minister tell me what additional support and funding will be made available to take into account local circumstances to ensure that my constituents, particularly the elderly and disabled, have access to local services? And in my own area, an example of this is Erskine, where large areas are connected by pathways, pathways which are not always cleared, and many of the roads are unsuitable for gritters. And in some cases, this leaves people housebound and isolated for several days. Minister. Hey, Mary Fee says she makes no apology for returning to the point about resources for local government, and she will not be surprised to say that I make no apology for saying that if you want to have more money for local government, you cannot also have more money for health, which has been demanded, more money for transport, money for education. At some point, you have to say where this money is going to come from. Yes. Do you not acknowledge the extent to which the financial circumstances in the UK have changed? Do you not acknowledge the fact that the budget has been cut for the Scottish Government? Have you not any responsibility for saying where these cuts should fall? I am more than happy to listen to the cases for particular additional spending, but you have to identify where that is coming from. And unless it comes with that, then I have to consider it is not serious. I have laid out the, the areas in which we provided extra resources to local government. I have also laid out the areas in which we, if there are exceptional circumstances, as we would always do in relation to flooding, uh, the point made by Alec Johnson in relation to exceptional damage to roads, that we will look at that. But local authorities have got the responsibility. They are the roads authorities. When I was a council leader, I was responsible for the local roads in my area, not one of which, incidentally, was a trunk road or a motorway. We had responsibility for all our roads. Of course it's difficult. There are pressures. I acknowledge that. And if there are exceptional pressures, we'll do what we can to help local authorities. But I believe we have made a fair settlement for local authorities. And if necessary, we're prepared to do more. Finally, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the event of a particularly bad winter, can the Minister inform me of his confidence that after a thawing of any ice that we have, that the infrastructure will be able to deal with localised flooding? Minister? I have the distinct impression that um, Stuart McMillan has a particular location in mind when he asked that uh, question. And I know that has been addressed by my colleague uh, Paul Wheelhouse along with Inverclyde Council. Uh, and of course, we can't hold back, uh, no man can hold back the tide. But uh, there is no question that we have to do more in terms of flood prevention. My own view, and I am not uh, the expert in this area, obviously, Paul Wheelhouse would know better than me, is that very often soft flood defences prove to be much more sustainable and effective than some of the hard flood defences that we have had over time. And I know a great deal of work has been done by WWF and others to make sure that happens. I think the situation which Stuart McMillan might be referring to is a rural, uh, an urban situation, rather, and we do try to make sure that at least the roads that we are responsible for are protected from flooding. But, of course, nobody can uh, anticipate what exceptional weather we may get. We do design this into the construction of our roads, and we continue to make sure that the roads which have been there for some time are better protected against flooding incidents. 
Thank you. That ends the statement from the Minister on winter resilience. We now move to the next item of business, which is our standards procedure and public appointments committee debate.